So, should Christians preserve the population and the planet? Or control it, the population, and preserve the planet? In its most recent State of the World report, released in January of this year, this, uh, this was written uh, years ago, Worldwide World Watch Institute lamented that fresh water shortages are overcurring in the U.S. and elsewhere, while worldwide stocks of rice are at 20-year lows, assuming for the sake of argument that such is actually the case, even today, an increase in CO2 could be the solution. Rather than the global warming nightmare envisioned by environmentalists for all these years, Dr. Jeffrey Baker, University of Florida's agronomy department, reports that with rice elevated, CO2 levels stimulate growth, and ultimately this translates into increased grain yield. We're getting typically anywhere from 30 to 40 percent increases in grain yield. We get increased carbon uptake through photosynthesis. We get a decline in carbon loss during nighttime respiration. We also get a decline in total water use. And all this translates into an increase in grain yield, which is the useful portion of the plant with rice. William F. Jasper comments in his review of environmental overkill, what happened to common sense? Anthropogenic man-made CO2 is estimated in total to total some 7 billion tons annually worldwide. Sounds like an enormous uh, sum. Well, nature, through volcanoes, geysers, and the respiration of countless organisms, contributes an estimated 200 billion tons annually. Man-made CFCs, plural fluorocarbons or chloral fur fluorocarbons, contribute roughly 750,000 tons of chloride to the atmosphere per year. Mother Earth contributed 600 million tons of chloride through sea water evaporation alone. Volcanoes provide many billions more. Not that any of these effluents, natural or man-made, matter that much one way or the other. When it comes to the greenhouse effect, a phenomenon essential to life on our planet as we know it, CO2 plays a relatively insignificant role. Indeed, notes Ray, although carbon dioxide is getting all the attention in greenhouse discussions, it is really water, the water vapor of the atmosphere and droplets in the clouds that is the main greenhouse gas. Water is responsible for 98% of all greenhouse warming. And the evidence from voluminous temperature measurements taken from weather monitoring stations throughout the world over the past 100 years, as well as the continuous temperature readings taken by the Tyros 2 satellite, shows no current global temperature trends, either up or down. But that is only part of the picture. The good professor surveys the frightening scenarios and frantic statements of the global warmies from a number of different angles, applying common sense and the facts of science so deftly that they perf the perfervid bleedings are a nice word they are completely exposed for the utterly absurd and fraudulent ravings that they have always been in summer similar fashion she method methodotic, methodically examines the emotionally and politically charged doomsday predictions of the self-appointed guardians of the ozone layer a major portion with their theory she points out is that ultraviolet radiation levels at the earth's surface are going down not up just the opposite of what the eco-fanatics tell us is happening as a result of man's pumping of CFCs into the atmosphere. Moreover, how do these CFCs rise into the stratosphere when the CFC molecules are four to eight times heavier than air? Answer, there is no evidence that they do reach the stratosphere, the fluorocarbons. At least 192 chemical reactions and another 48 photochemical reactions have been identified in the atmosphere stratosphere observes Ray, but none involves CFCs. <clears throat> nonetheless, nevertheless, because the U.S. Senate ratified the U.N.'s Montreal Protocol on ozone depletion, Americans will be paying hundreds of billions of dollars and suffering untold refrigeration and air conditioning headaches as a CFC ban, including Freon and Halons, goes into effect. This is a crime. As Ray points out, not only are CFCs safe, but all of the proposed substitutes have turned out to be very expensive, and some are toxic, flammable, and corrosive. All are inefficient compared to Freon. The cost of this one mad act, she notes, 
may be as high as $5 trillion worldwide by the year 2005. Now we've gone past that. The cost of in human lives is even more grim. Because of the severe effect on transportation and storage and food due to the loss or greatly increased cost of refrigeration, Dr. Ray estimates indicate that between 20 to 40 million people will die early from hunger, starvation, and foodborne diseases. Dr. Dixie Lee Ray recognizes that there are global stakes involved in the battle against the environmental extremists. More and more it is becoming clear that those who support the so-called New World Order or world government under the United Nations, or likewise now, have adopted global environmentalism as a basis for the dissolution of independent nations and the international realignment of power, she warns. Gary Benoit, Benoit, Benoit I guess, states, the ozone layer is not battered. CFCs have not been destroying the ozone layer. And the Antarctic ozone hole, which is not an actual hole, but a seasonal thinning of the ozone, was first observed in 1956, long before CFCs came into common use. We have Robert W. Lee. Let me clean my glasses here. New American. The Antarctic zone ozone depletion is evident during September and October, lasts for a few weeks, then returns to normal by late November or December. It has been measured as on a consistent annual basis only since 1985. In some years it worsens, while in others it improves, <clears throat> in what appears to be a natural ebb and flow associated more with such factors as sunspot activity, planetary waves, major storms, and the occurrence or absence of the El Nino warm current in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. On September 8, 1984, researchers at the National Center for Atmospheric Research announced that satellite measurements had found that the sun's ultraviolet radiation affects the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere and that the changes may have inflated estimates of human damage to the ozone layer, as it is still the case. The oceans of the world also uh, change the ozone layer. The center's Dr. John Gilley, so we get rid of the oceans. Dr. John Gilley asserted that in the past, if scientists thought that an ozone decrease had occurred in the stratosphere, it could have been mistaken for a chlorofluorocarbon effect from spray cans and other sources when it was a solar effect. So get rid of the sun and the oceans. If ozone is indeed declining on a global basis, there should be an increase in UVB radiation reaching the Earth's surface. To the contrary, however, ground measurements indicate that such UV has, if anything, been decreasing. Gary Benoit goes on again. As Dixie Lee Ray notes in her book, Environmental Overkills, ozone concentrations on any particular day may differ dramatically from the next. These changes in ozone concentration occur naturally. In the northern latitudes, ozone concentrations differ as much as 40%, even within a few days. By misrepresenting these natural fluctuations, the ozone layer can be made to appear battered when in fact it is not. But suppose the CLO really is destroying the ozone layer faster than nature's ability to replenish it. Would the chloride released by the breakup of CFCs in the atmosphere be responsible? Not at all, since chloride is one of the most abundant ions found in nature. Dr. Ray notes, seawater, there's sea, evaporation provides the atmosphere with 600 million tons of chloride each per year. So we destroy the seas. Volcanic eruptions emit millions of tons of chloride, and at least... Another million tons of chloride are produced naturally every year. By comparison, world population of CFCs at its peak reached 1.1 million tons per year. At this rate, there would be roughly 750,000 tons of chloride available from CFCs annually. So fluorocarbons produced by man dwarf what the oceans and the sun do. Besides, how could a sub and volcanoes? How could a substantial amount of CFC get into the stratosphere when CFC mer mer molecules or four to eight times heavier than air. And how do these heavier than air molecules, most of which are released in the northern hemisphere, find their way to the South Pole to create an ozone hole there? The volcanic eruption, Robert, Lee, Robert W. Lee says, of Mount Tambora in Indonesia in 1813 ejected 200 million tons of chloride way back then at the highest rate of worldwide CFC production. It would have taken about 282 years to produce as much chloride yielding CFCs as this one eruption. Mount Erebus, Erebus, 
in Antarctica has been producing 1,000 tons of chloride daily for more than two decades. The volcano was located, Dr. Ray observes, only 10 kilometers upwind of McMurdo Sound, where ozone measurements are made. The volcano pumps about 50 times more chloride annually than an entire year's production of CFCs. And interestingly enough, the amount of chloride calculated to be in the stratosphere at any one time is 50 to 60 times higher than the chloride that comes from CFCs every year. Other active volcanoes, such as El Chicon in Mexico, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, Mount Helena, USA, and many others, add far more chloride into the stratosphere than man. John F. McManus states in New American, in September 1991, NASA placed an unmanned satellite in orbit for the specific purpose of measuring man-made chemicals in the upper atmosphere. NASA then launched the Atlantis Space Shuttle in 1992, again to measure man-made chemicals in the upper atmosphere. They cannot admit that they have been wrong in so many press conferences for so many years by releasing the truth about only an infinitesimal quantity of CFCs ever rose up into the stratosphere. So now, they now claim no attempt was made to measure CFCs specifically and that neither mission had an instrument aboard to measure CFCs. Automotive Air Conditioning Engineer Bob Holtzknecht in Cocoa, Florida. Ozone is created by sunshine, energy rays from the sun. For several weeks per year, each year, the natural tilt of the Earth's axis shields the South Pole from daily sunshine. During those weeks, very little new ozone gets created. To attribute the ozone hole to escaping Freon in, Amer in Antarctica makes no sense. How many air conditioners and refrigerators exist on the whole continent? Zero. But references to Antarctica's annual ozone hole show up in the media every September at the end of the region's long, dark winter. There you go.